So um, today I'll be talking about affordable open manufacturing, uh, networking systems, and just everything in between. And it's a connection of how I came to work in the open field, uh, what meaning that had, and the perspectives I have, how, how to go about that and actually make it sustainable uh, for myself and the team that works with me. So um, as I was introduced, you probably already know, um, the thing is I've started doing things as a bachelor's and master's students and really playing around with the open because that was the only opportunity for me to build things. Um, and then I founded Institute Irnas to do this full time and have a few people to help me out. Um, I've got reasonably good background in community wireless networking and building Wi-Fi networks for different areas and applications where typical networking doesn't happen and thus I started creating a different kind of a network system which is called Kuruza, which and you will hear more about it in a moment. Um, just as a brief intro, um, it's very interesting to see how we actually do things and um, I'm by no means an expert on it, I'm trying out ideas and just seeing what sticks pretty much. So um, I founded Institute Ionas as a non-profit research and development organization. And this correlates to the hybrid model Kat mentioned before, um, that we have another non-profit which is Create Your Lab and it's actually a fab lab, which is our workshop during the day and the afternoon it's open for the public. And this is a good synergy between the tools I had at home um, and the Hack Lab, um, Fab Lab that was in the area. We joined forces a good year ago and just everyone brought the stuff in and we all can use it. We now all jointly improve our uh, tools range and can build very good things then. And recently, about nine months ago, we started also a for profit company which can take the open harbor and actually offer it to the customers and deal with the customer side and the production and procurement process. Um, just I'll be talking about a few projects today in a bit mixed fashion because that's the point of my talk. Um, just so you don't get confused, Kuruza is the wireless optical communication system. You can also see it outside. Good enough CNC is the range of all the machines we have from 3D printers, CNCs and other tools. Um, but there are two other projects. One is called a software platform called NodeWatcher for deploying networks, Wi-Fi routers and managing them on a large scale. And Symbiolab, which we started this year, is an open hardware biolab where we try to use and maximize the value of open hardware in bio research. So just jumping back about four years, um, I was in the Republic of Kyrgyzstan um, advocating for publicly accessible wireless, so legalizing the radio frequencies so people can use Wi-Fi and build their own networks since infrastructure is very bad. And you know, just over uh, beer, we had this idea. Well, we might use lasers. You know, as a rather naive undergrad at the time, I said, "Well, why not? I'll, I'll, you know, I'll make it happen. Can't be that bad, right?" Well, it turned out it's actually feasible, and I was quite surprised that this works. So I figured how we can build a high-speed system that allows us to connect buildings at distances one to two hundred meters at one or ten gigabits and it uses optical uh, data transmission, much like uh, you have fiber optics possibly running to your home, but if you don't have it, this is a potentially very good solution had to get it there fast, not waiting for the companies or the council to put it in in you know, five years time and 10 years time. So just imagine this scenarios and it becomes very apparent how this can be useful. Um, let's say the tower is you know, the end of the street or a block of flats across the road. Um, although they might have fiber, very fast internet, you might be stuck on an ADSL line or have very bad service and it's just getting across the road which is really your problem because something in the area already has that infrastructure. And with the system Kuruza, the aim is, okay, let's have everything that the optical fiber can offer but without the fiber actually being put in place. So we just use air to send data from building to building, you know, just like shiny laser pointer but actually sending data at very high speed. Um, and this can also apply to existing networks um, where the real problem is radio spectrum congestion. And to simulate that, uh, simply, um, if you imagine yourselves being Wi-Fi routers, if you all talked at the same time now in this room, no one would hear anyone. 
and this is what's happening on the radio spectrum with all the Wi-Fi access points. So when you open up your phone or computer, you see a list of a lot of networks and they're all shouting across each other and you can't send much data. And it's the same that's actually happening here. Um, but if we use light, we can very well direct the information and don't cause any noise for the surrounding environment. And the story today is really how this starts and how the development process goes and how ideas cross paths um, between different projects. So as you can imagine, it starts like this. This is the equivalent of breadboard and a mess of wires, super glue and you know just all the things you find lying about and just stick something together and it just barely works. You know, it just works enough so you don't give up and then you take the next step forward and actually try to make it robust enough to have some useful features. So uh, the problems with using the super glue assembly, for example, are it's complicated. I've used some very expensive lab equipment, a lot of super glue, which is not repeatable. I couldn't build a second device myself as well. And also there was a problem with a lot of irrelevant existing research um, on the scientific field. So the first step how I got into open was I went to my university workshop I said, well, see, I've got the parts here, so all the parts but the red ones, and I need you to machine me some pieces so this fits together and it's a good system. I said, fine, no problem, but you can have it done in nine months, which is, you know, obviously ridiculous. I'll be uh, finished with my degree by the time. So I went to the local uh, fab lab at the university and hey, there's a printer, I'll try to use it, let's see what happens. Um, and actually started learning that using 3D printing can be as a glue element. So instead of super glue, you really print just the parts you need to fit together what you have in a bit more reliable fashion and then build something that works. So this was the second version of Kuruza, I think, which you know seems much better than the previous one, right? And it's more or less the same components, but just two 3D printed parts um, having them, you know, stuck together. So this got me started really using open technology actively. And obviously, you know, I was impatient. I couldn't wait to be in line to use the 3D printer. So I said, well, might as well be build my own one. At the time, um, I was back in Slovenia working with a few friends from an electronic society saying, well, I need a printer. And, you know, a lot of people saying, well, I want the printer as well. So we actually ran a development project. We'll just make our own kits and you know, replicate some open hardware project, build the printers. Um, so I would like to thank uh, Ultimaker for you know, starting a very good open design. But from my perspective, that's not open enough to be practical. Um, and the simple fact is um, I didn't like some of their solutions. And the open design they posted used a lot of their you can't call them proprietary components, but there are components you can buy only from them. So you are really subjected to the single supply chain. And that was a good enough motivational factor for me to really go and try to redesign things just to use off the shelf parts, which you can order from China, from eBay, or buy locally in Europe. And this is how Troublemaker printers were born. Um, we built about 100 of them in electronic society in Slovenia. So this is just a bunch of people getting together making kits for themselves. So the first version was more or less an Ultimaker design, common parts, um, could be made in Fab Labs, and yeah, we made about 100 of them in 2013, and you know, everyone is still happy with them, and we are actively using them. But building a kit for a 3D printer actually gave me so many good ideas how to b about building a system Kuruza, that I started realizing that doing multiple projects is actually very good because you get exposed to different ideas and you can swap ideas pretty much between projects and move solutions from one to the other. So the first um, step obviously when having a reliable 3D printer was let's 3D print the whole system. Yeah, like just Let's print everything. It's, it's the magic solution. Like It will do whatever you want. Well, it was a good proof of concept, but it wasn't really practical. So the next stage, um, well, a few versions later, this is the Kuruza 1.0, which is a stable version now. Um, we tried a lot of things from having fully 3D printable structures, which 
they were open source, nicely drawn in open SCAD and all of that, but I would almost call them proprietary because it was such a complicated mechanical assembly that if you did not spend hundreds of hours figuring out what does what, you could not really change something and you know, use the open part of it for more than understanding the operation, but you couldn't really effectively change it. Like it was a pain for me as the original developer to change something, so obviously it was not a good idea. And the version on the right, which you can also see outside today, is figuring, well, actually, 3 printing is not a magical solution, and we should just properly apply it where needed. So you can have a look that the system actually uses steel rods um, to connect a few 3 printed parts together in a stack. And, you know, I got the three printed, uh, the steel rods from the 3D printer, which I just built, and, oh, hey, I can use this. I used it in the printer, might as well use it in the other project. And the same goes, for example, for the spring couplers, which you find in the 3D printer between motors and um, threaded rods. We use them in Kuruza as well now to uh, have the movement. So it's, if I was just doing the wireless optical system, it's a problem where, you see, you're reading your mindset and you don't look outside to get other solutions which are out there, but you really need to be exposed to them and realize how to use them. And for example, another case of this is the sliding bushings. Um, you know, it's something you normally see in a 3D printer, but hey, I had a bunch of them lying on my desk. I can actually port them to the wireless optical system and get the same feature as I have in the 3D printer there with the parts I have already on my desk. Um, although we've tried a number of solutions before, like 3D printing two parts, uh, sending them so they slide nicely, or one of the interesting solutions which was not the best but actually worked was, how do you make two 3D printed parts slide very nicely? Well, you actually print one part and the other, um, so you know you have a you have a cylinder and you put some part in between, um, but you use Teflon tubes, so the Bowden tubes you see on 3D printers, the, the white tubes, the filament goes in. Um, this is a very nice sliding element, um, so you can just cut some tubes, sandwich them between 3D printed parts, and get a very good sliding action as well with micrometer precision. And, you know, ideas crossing back and forth. So, doing this and a much more complicated set of uh, development over the course of about two years, this is now the final version. And the key point here is it's modular, meaning that it is a research platform a lot of universities are using now. And it's very simple because if I want to change the motor module, which is the one on the right with the motor, I just need to you know, loosen two screws, I can pull the motor module off, I can design my own one, fix this one, swap it, and pretty much in real time I can change parts in a modular structure. And this is the same point we've seen with c the camera as well. You don't cement everything on the same board. Obviously, it's a bit more optimal, but if you want to be usefully open so people can change things, it's good to leave like a simple common interface. Someone can just design a module, not redesign the whole thing from scratch. And just to show how it looks for assembly is, you can see that you, know, you very nicely just stack everything together, print it, and then you have the whole assembly done in a few minutes from all the independent modules. Um, and just the photo with the enclosure, which is another interesting story. Uh, since building enclosures is typically regarded as very expensive if you don't buy the enclosure pre-made uh, or pre-cut. Well, what we found out is actually you have this aluminum extrusions, just you know, normal tubes. Just cut them either with CNC, plasma, or whichever way in a bit more interesting shape. Um, slide your 3D printed parts in, and you have a nice enclosure in pretty much no time. And doing all this work with CNC machines, 3D printers, um, pose the question of what is good enough for you? And this is something we generally disregard in our daily lives. It's like, Every advertisement is, you need this because it's better. It will, you know, you will save one and a half seconds a year doing this or buying this or, you know, you will magically grow and get younger or something along the lines. Or you need a faster phone because this and that. But actually, if you just want to call someone, 
an old Nokia is just good enough for you. Like if this is what you do, it's just fine. And for say a majority of people, it will be good enough to call. Um, it's obviously nice to have new features, but you know, it's good enough and has the basic feature. So in terms of digital manufacturing, this is the question we're now asking and trying to build a system which is good enough. What you can see outside the 3D printer and the CNC machine, we call good enough CNC. And there are a few key points to this. We want to empower people, not, not exclude them. We want people to build things locally, um, meaning that anywhere in the world you should be able to replicate this. And in the worst case, you only need to get a small box by mail or you know, in carry-on from somewhere. And it's better simple to get a small box somewhere, but not a 50 kilo uh, packet. So fixing everything is also important. Like imagine you're in the middle of Africa or actually on a Sunday uh, in Vienna, everything is closed. There, you're not getting the spare part. Um, and if you can fix it, you know what the problem is, fine, you will. You know, like, for example, we use roller skate bearings. If you're desperate, you will take your uh, roller skates apart and take the bearing out and just put it in the CNC machine. Might as well, right? Um, and obviously hack and make everything. So have the freedom to customize things per your needs. And this is the point of open, which I believe we quite often miss. Um, it's the extra added value or the reduced frustration we can have with open products. Um, generally, we w just want something that works, but our minds are put to ease if we know, okay, I can actually find out or at least try finding out how this works if I need a problem. Primarily, I just want it to work. Um, and the fact just saying something, it needs to be open, well, it doesn't have the added value until you need to use it in practice. So we also built a small diagram here, which is uh, regarded as a business model, how we try to go about this is, um, you can make the machine at very low cost yourself. So um, the source is up on top, open source hardware, and you've got a running machine down the top. And you've got this maze, which you can navigate one or the other way. So. You can buy the parts yourself, you can 3D print them, laser cut, drill holes, make everything, assemble it, follow the instructions online. And if you just follow this path, you see it kind of adds up to a lot of time, some equipment and not that much money. But obviously to cover the development costs, we would like you to be lazy and actually just buy a full kit and you know, invite us to do a workshop and help you out build the machine because that way we can actually cover the development, but it's open up for everyone to choose the path they want. Reality, everyone wants a product, so we are trying to figure out what's the best way of doing this. And the key points that follow on from here are open hardware tools should be manufacturing baseline. So good enough CNC is not to compete with industrial machinery. And the goal is, you have this as a baseline. So if you want to cut a piece of wood or say make an acre kit for urban gardening, this or that, this is the default cheapest possible way how to build a machine like this. Obviously you can buy a better machine with higher precision, higher speed, but open hardware can really be seen as a point where no company can really sell you a worse product for more money than this because you're always thinking, well, this is the fault. And in best case, they can just adapt it and we'll probably figure that out at some point. So our effort on good enough CNC at the moment is we want this to be the baseline for global replication. Please do better if possible, but here's the baseline and here's the bare minimum you can do useful things with. Um, and the real, real point is, commonly available parts, ship small lightweight packages if needed, and all the heavy parts should be local. So currently, this manifests in the Troublemaker version 2 printer. You can see outside, it's a beefed up, bit bigger version of the original Troublemaker. All of the shelf parts from multiple suppliers, um, all the components, electronics, and everything is open source. I dare to call also the bearings, screws, and all that open source, because it's as open source as a chair. Like, you know, everyone makes chairs. There are viable businesses selling chairs and making different kinds of chairs. But, you know, there's no patent for a chair, really. Um, 
you know, just the basic chair as it is. And so goes for the screws and most parts uh, in the printer. So I don't think there are any actual problems uh, in the supply chain of this. And in long term, the philosophy you see for open hardware license from CERN is if you want to keep uh, a particle accelerator running in CERN, their condition for open hardware is actually it needs to be open because we can't afford a company going bust and not being able to service their equipment in 30 years time. So it needs to be open because then we can fix it ourselves or just find another company that will do it based on that. And it's the same thing here. Um, if you buy parts for a printer from a company that just produces that part, it's perfect, you know, purposely made, you can have this problem. But it's important to note that a DIY oriented system does not scale. So you can't volume build this and sell finished products. And this is what Ultimaker has shown very nicely is that people want to assemble the printers and they have streamlined manufacturing of an open design, but it's not really practically open. You can possibly fix it and it's hackable, but you can't really make it yourself that way without a significant effort. So this jumps forward to the CNC mill, well, we call it a hybrid machine because you strap whatever you have onto it. A plasma cutter, a mill as you can see outside, a laser, um, pretty much whatever you come up with. Just being very general purpose and also noting, say you have a plasma held, held torch, you have a drill, you can actually mount it on a machine so you don't need to buy much more. Um, it's not super precise but it gets the job done. Um, and for example, having a very modular and open design means that the machine perfectly fits my car because the design is not dependent uh, on the dimensions, but actually I just measured the car and the machine perfectly fits in and I can drive around the Europe with it. Um, and it can be whatever, plasma, laser, mill, something else. Uh, also, currently very interesting work we're doing is putting it in a suitcase. Um, so we just sent uh, one suitcase, as you see in the image um, above, to Nepal. Um, so in one, there's a plasma cutter and all the small essential bits and pieces. Um, the steel, you see they, they're finding in Nepal without any problems, angle grinding it uh, to the right lengths, and very shortly they will have a built machine. So our approach to this is machines like that should be only available through workshops. Because the process of building something empowers the one who builds it to service it and have full ownership of it. So you really know what you have and you're very likely to fix 90% of the mistakes because you know, if you built it once, it's not a problem rebuilding it again, especially if you have good online sources. Um, so we're inviting you if you have interest. Um, we have this model of one day, six machines in that one day, um, in a fab lab around Europe with two of our mentors and you can get people up to speed. Um, on a bit more electronic side, um, we have this interesting system which we figured um, actually we can use low cost optical fibers to control the whole machine and take the complexity out of controlling CNC machines, having very good shielded cables and complicated wiring to do this. Um, the ones of you who might be familiar with electronics you can, you know the optocoupler element. And that's pretty much an LED and a receiver in a small chip uh, which isolate electric circuits. So we're looking at that, okay, we're building a CNC, we need to put a bunch of optocouplers, make it robust, get good cables. But then thought, actually, if we take a step back, optocoupler is an LED and a receiver in a small box. What if we just cut the box in half, put a piece of optical fiber in between, and we have exactly uh, the same function. Um, so with a bit more development, we came to the system called Toslink CNC. You can also have a look at it outside. Um, but in a demo system set up on a desk, it looks roughly like this. So we've got a controller here on the left, which has one optical fiber just going from motor to motor um, and connecting it all that way. Red and black wire is just power. But open doesn't stop here. Open can save lives. And it can save turtles and conserve the world as we have it. So we worked recently with um, London Zoo 
on saving this turtle. So these are um, nice large turtles uh, in Africa and they're becoming extinct due to various reasons. Um, the thing is, at London Zoo they've designed something called Mataki, which is an open source electronics primarily made for tracking birds. But you figured, well, actually, if we make a nice modular enclosure, we can put that electronic on turtle and we can see when it comes back. And previously, there have been some very closed source solutions costing several thousands of euros, so you could really afford just to track one turtle. It doesn't really help when you're trying to save all of them. So we've discussed and went through a number of solutions and came up with this. Um, so this is pretty much just an aluminium plate with some hot bonded polyurethane on it and an acrylic piece milled on an open source machine. Um, it's very simple, it's just an enclosure made from some very common parts. But doing this project and saving some turtles, we learned about the process of uh, molding polyurethane on aluminium as such. And you know what? The new version of Caruso we're building, this is the bottom one on the right, which is a product and orientated for more mass production because everyone wants a finished box. Um, and if they really want an open source version, they can build the previous one, which is fully usefully open source. We learned that actually we can use the polyurethane as a pivot mechanism, so as a flexible membrane up in front, instead of a piece of rubber sandwich in between two 3D printed parts as before. So going off and doing something completely different brought a solution back to the first open project. Although this is quite a lot going within our organization, these are the clear examples to me, but having things open means that you go out and see, hey, this is a good solution. I can use this and we can build on this collective mind of great innovation. So just to conclude, um, the interdisciplinary development is always very good. And even if we specialize, open enables us that we don't need to be interdisciplinary, but we can very quickly find about the solutions in the tech others have and how that impacts our lives in pretty much every day. And in Fab Lab environments, for example, we can really see the synergy between all of these different projects, people talking, ideas changing, projects, and so on. Um, yeah, if you want to follow up on this, um, you know, hold me publicly accountable, um, get in touch via Twitter or via website. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, please.